So Frank Starling curve and the factors affecting end diastolic volume. The normal curve, by this time you are already aware of the curve, no confusions, right? Myocardial stretching, the green color, they are increasing your end diastolic volume or the myocardial stretching. So more stroke volume. Blue colored arrows, everything is decreasing. Visitergo, visofranti, increased pumping action of skeletal muscles, increased blood volumes and all these are increasing your this thing. And this we will discuss in factors affecting the venous return. We will discuss each point individually. What is the clinical significance of Frank's styling mechanism? This law explains that blood ejected by each ventricle per heartbeat is the same. So the right ventricle cardiac output, the left ventricle cardiac output per beat should be same. If it is not same, then there will be problem. So the Frank's styling law begins to operate to equalize the two output in the normal beat to beat variation. Another significance is that it is life saving in cardiac failure. How? Left ventricle failure, let us suppose the person has the failure of the left ventricle. So left ventricle will not pump the entire blood into systemic circulation that causes accumulation of the blood within left ventricle. So that will decrease the blood supply to the vital organs and accumulation of blood in left ventricle initiates the operation of Frank's styling mechanism. However, when accumulation of blood is too great, the Frank styling law will fail to operate leading to decrease in the blood supply to the vital organs and ultimately death may occur. So Frank styling law up to a certain degree it is life saving saving in cardiac failure. Limitations. Frank styling mechanism cannot keep on operating at all the levels. There has to be some limit. We said up to certain physiological limits. So what happens? Extreme stretching of the cardiac muscle fiber, the actin and filaments are pulled apart and the tension declines completely. This is seen in heart failure. Take home message. Although all of you are at home during the lockdown period, so it's the normal scenario that we say take home message. So in that case, it will be take away message. Take away message with you is that a healthy heart muscle is like a spring. The Frank Starling law states that more the heart fills, the stronger will be the force of contraction. I still emphasize on the words up to a certain physiological limits and not beyond. Now coming to one of the major determinants of cardiac output, you said heart rate, stroke volume. Then you said stroke volume depends on venous return, that is the intrinsic regulation. So now coming to venous return. Venous return is what? The flow of blood from the periphery, from the upper part of the body through the superior vena cava to the right atrium, from the lower part of the body through the inferior vena cava to the right atrium. So the blood coming to the right atrium from the periphery is venous return. More the venous return, more the stroke volume, more blood can be pumped out. Venous return is venous pressure minus the right atrial pressure divided by venous resistance. That's simple. Now factors determining venous return, you can get a short note on this. These are the pumps that determine the venous return. Skeletal muscle pump, respiratory pump, abdominal pump, cardiac pump, atrial pump, ventricular compliance. Just mug it up. What do you mean by skeletal muscle pump? Skeletal muscle pump means in your lower limbs, in your upper limbs, the deep veins they have, a, they are working because of the effect of the muscles, contractile muscles that are present. Mechanism of muscle pump. So this is a leg muscle, the calf that has been shown, there are two valve, proximal valve, distal valve, deep vein is there. And these valve which will enable only one way flow of blood from toes towards the heart and the blood cannot come back. So these are one way valve. So skeletal muscle of the calf muscles, calf muscles they are acting as a contractile tissue. So deep veins in the arms and legs are surrounded by skeletal muscle. They have one way valve that open when the muscle contract but stop the blood from going down when the muscle relax. We don't want the blood to flow back to the toes. Right, you have to pump the blood towards the heart. You have to increase the venous return. So when you are walking, the muscles will squeeze. When you are walking, the muscles are contracting. So when the muscles are squeezed, they will push all the blood towards the heart. But what happens when you are sitting for a prolonged time or standing for a prolonged time, then the blood is not being pushed up. So sometimes you may even faint. Right. So what is the suggestion to you? The person who is sitting, standing for a prolonged time may suffer from venous pooling in the legs. Blood is not going above. So venous return is reduced. So the suggestion is that you can activate your skeletal muscle pump by just moving your toes or legs 
or tensing them periodically that means alternately contracting and relaxing them right okay respiratory pump or thoracic pump respiratory pump means the mechanism of breathing facilitates the venous return to normal intrapleural pressure this already we know mechanics of respiration there are two pressures atmospheric pressure that is intra alveolar pressure another is intrathoracic also called as intrapleural pressure the normal intrapleural pressure at end expiratory position is minus 2 it becomes more negative minus 5 during inspiration and because of this the pressure is becoming more negative and the volume will increase because pressure volume by Boyle's law has to be kept a constant so all the change this change is also transmitted to the IVC because in the thorax only you have the inferior vena cava and the valves of the heart everything is located there closely so the part of this pressure change in the respiratory cycle in the intrathoracic pressure is also transmitted to inferior vena cava and the valves of the heart so even the right atrial pressure is also lowered that facilitates the venous return now what is abdominal pump just like we had respiratory pump a pump in the lungs that is intrathoracic pressure abdominal pump during inspiration the intra-abdominal pressure rises because of the descent of the diaphragm diaphragm goes down so the pressure in the abdomen is increasing and this increase in intra-abdominal pressure will again increase the pressure in the right atrium so there will be increased venous return now the heart also has a pump cardiac pump that's very nice so the cardiac pump influences the venous return by visitorgo or visofronti mechanism visitorgo means the propelling force which pushes the blood from the veins into the right atrium you are pushing the blood from various deep veins into the right atrium so this is supplemented by the elastic recoil of the arterial wall wind kessel effect wind kessel effect okay in the hemodynamics of the heart you know that when the during the systole of the heart the blood flow in the vessels is great now how does the blood flow happens in the vessel during the diastole and the heart is relaxing is there no blood flow during the relaxation of the heart the blood vessels are not uh, causing any flow they are causing the flow how because of wind kessel effect wind kessel effect is recoiling of the blood vessel during the systole of the heart the blood vessels contract squeeze the blood and when the heart is relaxing these they, there is elastic recoil of the vessel wall so this brings about the flow smooth flow of the blood in the vessels so visitorgo is the propelling force which pushes blood from the superior vena cava or inferior vena cava into the right atrium visofronti is the suction that is the suction force from the front heart is pulling the blood from the great veins into right atrium so both of these are being operational as a cardiac pump you call it another important point is blood volume so far we've discussed the respiratory pump skeletal pump thoracic pump now the blood volume increased blood volume increases the venous return vice versa of course when the blood volume is more in the body more venous return more endostolic volume more preload on the heart more stroke volume more cardiac output sympathetic discharge we said extrinsic factor it causes venoconstriction leading to increased venous return venous return yes example in exercise atrial pump activity you know that 15 to 20 percent of the ventricular filling it occurs due to atrial contraction so atrial contraction is increased during the sympathetic stimulation so during sympathetic stimulation more ventricular filling atria will contract more forcefully and more ventricular filling will occur ventricular compliance normally the ventricle muscle must be compliant means it should be stretchable so that it can accommodate a lot of blood during the diastole so it should be compliant if it is not compliant if it is not flexible in certain diseases then the blood will not be filled properly so these are the factors affecting venous return so we've discussed the intrinsic or the heterometric in all the aforesaid factors the cardiac muscle fiber was altering its length here extrinsic means the homometric same length of the cardiac muscle fiber so stroke volume increases but the increase in muscle length is not there so how the stroke volume is increasing the heart is still beating forcefully because of cardiac sympathetic nerves and the hormone epinephrine so what do these cardiac sympathetic nerves and epinephrine do the increased contractility of the heart how mechanism is increased calcium influx there will be more calcium influx and what will this calcium do bring about more forceful contraction how does the calcium increase it is because of the activation of beta 1 adrenergic receptors by norepinephrine epinephrine or via protein kinase right so there will be more cytosolic calcium more cross bridge formation 
Now coming to ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is percentage of end diastolic volume ejected with each beat. It is the ratio of stroke volume to end diastolic volume. That is, it is proportion of the blood in the ventricles that is pumped out. So a healthy heart normally has an ejection fraction of 50 to 75 percent under resting condition. It may go as high as 90 percent during strenuous exercise. Well. And a failing heart may have ejection fraction 30% or less. In a heart failure patient, we do eco, non-invasive, echocardiography. You just check the ejection fraction. How much blood is being ejected out of the heart? That will tell you the condition of the heart. Right? So, increase contractility. Normal end diastolic volume is 130 ml. End systolic volume is 65 ml. For a stroke volume of about 70. So, you had 130 ml blood in the heart and 70 ml was ejected out and 70 this one uh, 65 ml remained so this is approximate 75 okay 135 okay so this normal end diastolic volume you can say is 135 ml so end diastolic volume will be about 65 sv 70 ml or 75 ml so this is just uh, rough an example for you under sympathetic influence for the same adv of 130 ml the esv might be 35 ml and sv 100 ml so sympathetic stimulation shifts the frank starling curve to the left that's important factors causing increased myocardial contractility so the third one that you see is the normal and one two the first and second one is the shift to the left upward shift and to the left so that is increased in myocardial contractility maybe due to sympathetic nerves or epinephrine Decrease in myocardial contractility shifts the frank styling curve to the right and downwards. Afterload. So far, we just talked about the preload, the venous return. Is there any importance of afterload? Of course it is. The peripheral resistance. The heart has to pump blood to the various vessels. Do those vessels have a good diameter? The caliber of the diameter, the viscosity of blood is good enough. So and that's also important otherwise there will be resistance the preload is good but the afterload there's a lot of peripheral resistance so the blood is not being pumped into the vessels so that's another factor influencing cardiac output variations in cardiac output this is just the interesting facts that during sleep or moderate changes in environmental temperature no change in cardiac output then when does cardiac output increase when you take anxiety excited eating your eating food exercising High environmental temperature, pregnancy, epinephrine, so there may be variation. Decrease sitting or standing from the lying position, rapid arrhythmias, any heart disease, the cardiac output will decrease. How do you measure cardiac output? That's again a short question. Method based on fixed principle, indicator dye dilution technique, thermodilution technique and echocardiography. So nowadays we are using echocardiography because it is a non-invasive method and it will tell you about the heart ejection fraction, the end diastolic volume, the valvular defects, everything. So it's preferred. Earlier we used the fixed principle also. Fixed principle is important. Amount of substance taken up by an organ or the whole body per unit time is equal to arterial level of the substance minus the venous level times the blood flow. Q is equal to A minus V, arterial concentration of the substance minus V, venous concentration of the substance multiplied by blood flow. So, F flow will be Q divided by A minus V. So, this blood flow will be cardiac output. So, you can calculate the cardiac output by using certain substances. Maybe you can use even oxygen. So, in this method, cardiac output is determined by measuring the pulmonary blood flow because we know the pulmonary blood flow will be the same as the right ventricle output and right ventricle output will be same as left ventricle output which will be in turn same as the cardiac output. So, pulmonary blood flow will be amount of oxygen taken up by lungs per minute. Can we know the amount of oxygen taken up by lungs per minute? Yes, by spirometry you can. Divided by arterial concentration of oxygen minus venous concentration of So the VO2 can be measured from the venous blood sample taken from the pulmonary artery directly with the help of cardiac catheter. So you have to put a catheter inside the heart. So that requires a lot of expertise and technique. Arterial oxygen concentration can be measured from any peripheral artery, example brachial artery. So calculation, output of the left ventricle will be oxygen consumption 
that you assessed using spirometer divided by arterial concentration of oxygen minus venous concentration. So let us an example, maybe oxygen content 250 divided by 190 minus 140, so 250 divided by 55 liters per minute, this will be your cardiac output. Advantages of using this fixed principle and uh, you're using oxygen here, advantages is also very accurate. Disadvantage, as I told you, catheterization with expert hand and expertise is required and it is difficult to measure the cardiac output in ambulatory patients who are just ambulatory and during exercise. Another method is indicator. You can put some indicator or dye for measuring the cardiac output. An indicator or radioactive isotope is injected into circulation, usually through arm vein, and concentration of this indicator is measured. Again, flow will be quantity of dye injected. That is usually 5 gram, and we use the Evans blue dye because of the characteristics. So, quantity of dye injected divided by C into T mean concentration of dye that you will assess by taking serial samples of the arterial blood every two seconds and time duration in the second of the first passage of the dye through the artery so when the first when the first passage of the dye occurred in the artery we have to take the time duration in second prerequisite it should be non-toxic must mix evenly in the blood relatively easier to measure its concentration there should not be any alteration of cardiac output or hemodynamics of blood flow and it must not be changed by the body during mixing or amount change must be known procedure as we said 5 milliliters of venous blood is withdrawn from the anticubital vein it is mixed with 5 mg evans blue dye the blood containing dye is injected rapidly into the vein so now you have a dye inside your body Serial samples of arterial blood will be taken from the brachial artery every two seconds and the concentration of dye is estimated and we plot a graph. Concentration of the dye versus time. So this is the dye, the red colored is the resting time. During the rest, the dye concentration and when you are exercising, right? So when you are exercising, the spike is reached earlier and it is reaching the peak earlier. The slope is more steep. So this is the concentration of the dye in mg per liter and versus the time. So you can put the formula and calculate. F is equal to Q divided by CT. Already we told this thing. It is accurate method. Disadvantages should not be repeated in short time because if you repeat it in short time, the dye is still in your body, in your blood. And again, you are giving the dye. So the concentration of the dye of the earlier use might give some errors. Thermodilution method is just the same as the indicator dilution technique, but here we're using cold saline, normal saline, which is cold, instead of the Evans blue. Advantages: saline is harmless, cold is dissipated in the tissues, so recirculation is not a problem, and it can be repeated many times if needed. Right. So thermodilution method is similar to the indicator dilution technique but here cold saline used as an indicator. Known volume of sterile cold saline is injected into inferior vena cava and temperature of blood entering the heart from the IVC and that of blood leaving the heart via pulmonary artery is determined by use of thermistors. So you are measuring the temperature of the blood. Change in temperature is inversely proportional to the amount of blood flowing through the pulmonary artery. Advantages, line is harmless, cold is dissipated in tissue, so recirculation not a problem. It can be repeated many times if needed. Echocardiography is a non-invasive procedure. It's very good. It refers to ultrasonic evaluation of the cardiac functions. You don't need to put any catheters. You don't need to put, give any injections. It involves the B-scan ultrasound at a frequency of 2.25 MHz using a transducer which receives the reflected waves. So you can know the endostolic volume, the encystolic volume, the cardiac output, valvular defects, everything using this echocardiography, even the ejection fraction. So, coming to the end of the lecture, what are we supposed to have? A soft heart, open and vulnerable, a stiff heart, firm and steadfast. We need to have a frank sterling heart. The heart, sometimes it needs to be soft because it has to receive the blood during diastole. And then during systole, it has to be stiff, it has to push out the blood. So heart should be a balance between the two, soft and stiff. So thank you very much. Hope this session was of your benefit. Good day.